first of all, you know, um, uh, my 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 gratitude to uh, both uh, Professor Matthews and Professor uh, Mithilish uh, Kumar for uh, for thinking about me uh, uh, from from Bangalore. I was there in your city for a while. I worked at uh, CSCS for a while uh, last uh, decade. So uh, so I have an intimate connection with uh, with your city. Um, uh, 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 now, again, you know, just the way uh, Professor Matthews was uh, telling me, when we conceived of the book, when I edited this book on populism uh, and its limits, you know, I was thinking of various disciplines. And just like Professor Matthews said, as a student of literature, I was also thinking about how to how to connect, uh, how to how to conceive of the idea of art, literature, and populism. Although I had some intuition in my mind, uh, as I went on, it sort of became slightly solidified. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is um, is give you my again what one can call an oxymoron, you know, an intuitive logic. Let us say, uh, intuitive logic of of what I understand by uh, when I say populism, and it has direct connection with what Professor Matthews has said right now. Uh, in my own way, uh, I think there's already a dialogue which is beginning from what she said. Uh, let me go ahead with what, whatever I have to say. There are certain things which are tentative, uh, uh, and that I think is, uh, I would like to, you know, uh, have a discussion at the end, maybe certain points which I have to further uh, sort of uh, work further on those things. Now, um, the old point, let us begin with the old point. What does art has to do with culture? Uh, this connection between um, art and literature and culture, this word. Now, if literature is a, is a cultural phenomena, uh, by the way, I gave a title to this talk called Enchaining Imagination. Now, I'll, I'll talk about imagination uh, in the second half of my talk, but it has intricate connection. Now, if literature is a cultural phenomena, uh, literature can be, or art, let us say, it can, be, uh, it can be used as a tool, or it can be manipulated as a tool, or it could be used fruitfully as a tool, so on and so forth. You know. That would be one approach. The other is, if, we, if the culture, the whole idea of uh, things which are, which are produced, which are circulate, uh, and which have a reception, uh, whether, whether that can be sieved through the, what one calls literary. Now, this word literary, and today I'll talk more about, although it's about art and populism, but you know, I'll talk more about literature. Of course, we can talk about uh, it's connected. But what exactly is literary then? You know, that is one of my, my points in the today's talk. Now, I'll go back very fast, quickly to 1939, almost a, almost a century ago, where this very well-known essay by this art critic, uh, Clement Greenberg, wrote this essay, some of you may, may be aware of that, Our God and Kish. Our God and the Kish. Now, Kish, <coughs> Clement Glen, uh, Greenberg was uh, arguing in that very well-known essay that it has now become the part, integral part of our productive system, right? And um, the way that high culture could not be, right? That was a, and, and you'll remember Dusha's, you know, uh, ready-mates and so on, you know, that, so there was, uh, people were understanding that, you know, the whole idea of judging, judging art, the whole idea of criterion of art were, were, were being challenged, you know, the earlier ideas of, of judgment. Now, that is one very important thing of today's talk today, you know, how, how do we judge art, you know, how, on, what is the basis of, the, of setting the criterion that will decide what is populist and what is not possibly in some way. Okay. Now, Greenberg said, well, yes, kitsch is very much part of art. We have to bring that together. But Greenberg also said that in that essay that whoever is engaging in, in Kish and what is known as avant-garde at that point of time, it has a certain kind of, you know, bohemianism in, uh, in, in their attitude. There is a kind of, uh, they want to detach themselves from culture society, uh, from the bourgeois society, and, and, and so on and so forth, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, there, there is a very love-hate relationship between the avant-garde and the, and the, what one can call the left imagination at that point of time. But nevertheless, that's a separate point. We can come to that. But there is already an understanding of, of the idea of Kish, which has to be brought, brought together. Now, today, I think, you know, I'm, I'm using Greenberg to begin with because well, I, I want to take seriously the idea of Kish. I mean, if after 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people say today we are discussing certain things as populist, which has eventually become art, 
then we'll, I mean, that's not the kind of judgment that we want to make on ourselves. So I want to take that seriously and then see whether one passes through cert certain, you know, tests, which, you know, one uh, will talk about that, you know. Now, if we, if we put though that, this Greenberg's writing on today's digital <coughs> world, uh, now, Kindle and Spotify apparently give us a degree of access to the best that has been thought, best that has been said, you know, uh, that a, a Medici or a Rockefeller could not have brought, uh, 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 you know, at any price. But at simultaneous lighting, they also remind us that almost no one cares about uh, certain art objects or certain works of literature. For instance, if you search for Beethoven's Fifth Symphony on the on Spotify, the most popular recording of the most popular piece is you'll see is 1984 by Herbert von Karajan. You know? with the Berlin Philharmonic. Now, if you want to go beyond that, you won't get anything, you know. I mean, it's, there is a, uh, there's a bar there, you know. And also the first movement has been streamed 1.5 million times and the third movement half a million times, which itself tells a story that, you know, uh, the audience is very quick. that doesn't want to engage with, uh, you know, a piece of uh, longish art and so on, you know. By contrast, there, of course, there are other kinds of things which are all everywhere there, you know. Now, what, what it does quickly, I think, you know, that whether these instruments, you know, Kindle and Spotify are actually reaching the so-called mass is uh, one one has to, I don't have that data, you know, we are not sure. There has been other kinds of reading, what one calls, if it is being massified in a way, has it actually, is it actually reaching? On the other hand, the other side of it is that people who would be engaged with, with, uh, with, uh, with certain kinds of culture, so I mentioned Beethoven, at times, you know, would be aristocrats, you know, a certain kind of bourgeois later on and so on. You know, and they would guard culture, they, too. but they will also have the rigor, those people, to go back to, to, the, uh, to, 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 to not only the details of, of the recordings that has happened before, but also everything about that music and so on, you know. So there's something happening with this culture, what we're seeing now, I think, is what one has, what one calls, it is not about high culture and low culture anymore. Right, that di that divide was already there in 1970s and 1980s. You know, remember early Poco movement and so on. You know, now now what one sees is what some people have called no brow culture. You know, neither high nor nor low. You know, no brow kind of a situation where there's a monochromatic kind of a situation often. You know, now you know the second date after 1939. I would I would of course flag as many of you know Adorno and Horkheimer's famous essay on you know, uh, uh, writings on, on culture in the uh, culture industry. And the whole Frankfurt School was invested in that. And they're very well known. They, uh, they, they talked about mass deception and amusement as an extension of labor. And that those was the time, of, you know, people were alienated, et cetera. It's now we don't hear that word. We, we hear something else, you know, that word alienation uh, has, has been replaced by something else. I'll come to that, you know. Now, in 63, 1963, Adorno himself said in an, another essay, Culture Industry Reconsidered, he insisted that consumers of mass culture actually despise and resent them, you know, that there's a masochism in, in people who engage in these kind of things. You know. It was an inspired guess. I'm not sure whether that, that insight can be applied to what I just now mentioned to people who, uh, who uh, including all of us, who, who, who get into this popular populist uh, you know, art forms and so on, and we are into self-loathing. You know, may, maybe we are not into self-loathing, but something else is happening. People are willfully, you know, getting into all of that. That is the whole thing. Populism is one part of that is people, I mean, where is exactly people's will and where they're manipulated? How does one decide that, you know? Where is the line to the, that decision? Now, anyway, quickly, you know, I would say, the first point about this kind of float sounds that we are seeing, you know, common sayings and proverbs, frequent collocations, conversational routines, you know, discourse particles and interjections, tunes, catchphrases, uh, 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 retweets, you know, uh, you know, this whole word, this word retweet, consider this word, you know, is there sort of an imitative aspect to it? You know, this imitation, I think, is the first point about, about populism, this idea of getting into a herd. Now, of course, there's coding, replication, circulation, etc. But in this, in this no-brow culture, where one, I mean, other critics have also called this, you know, flyover culture, as if you are passing through a heartland from an airplane window 
you are visiting uh, culture, as it were. Uh, now, um, so the point, point about imitation is, especially if we think in terms of literature and art, that you know that one metaphor is trying to describe the same metaphor and same metaphor and same metaphor in 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 in, in a self-referential manner. You know, the production is the object of its own investigation, right? So. Richard Dawkins famously said, "You know, this is like this rhetorical figures that we see now." Um, and the, I'm taking the word rhetoric very seriously. Students of literature just to take the word rhetor. I mean, the ancient rhetor of the of Greece and you know other parts were minstrels. You know, they knew how to work with work with the form form of literature. Now, if that is what, that idea of rhetor rhetorician, you remember Mark Antony's famous speech and so on. You know, a, 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 not not only politician but but artists have to have a sense of rhetoric. Rhetoric means you are you are invested in figures of speech. Without figures of speech, you know how can you be how, how can you be a, a, an artist? You know how, I mean consciously or unconsciously you are playing with form, right? So in, instead of that, if you are replicating, there is a there is a form of pragmatism possibly. You know uh, um, I, I'm not sure whether this can what what we see now can be called kitsch or not. You know now. You know, one very famous, interesting uh, sociologist that I have been working with in the last, you know, three or four years is a French, so you know, criminologist and social psychologist by the name of Gabriel Tarde. Gabriel Tarde, you know, in the uh, work in 19th century, and he was a sociologist. But today, because I'm talking about literature, he wrote a very interesting, you know, science fiction come sociological novella called The Underground Man. At the turn of the last century, 1903 or so, and he conceived of that. He went to. He suggested in that, uh, you know, uh, novella that human beings have. Earth has come to a standstill because sun is no more existent. Sun is gone, you know, and it's a glacial age, and therefore human beings have gone down inside the earth, right? And uh, and and inside the earth, there's a lot of energy, and human beings are beginning afresh. With civilization. The state of nature is, you know, was it a happy state? Was it a sad state? Was it a state, as Hobbes has said, people were brutish and, you know, uh, fighting each other, etc. You know, now, uh, Carter said, in that Tata, you know, uh, made, made up that novel in such a novella in such a fashion that he called these people now who have got inside the earth and starting civilization afresh are very avid, very, they have a lot of responsibility. But what kind of responsibility? The responsibility of imitation, responsibility of pure imitation. And he called them troglodytes, troglodytes, or he called them auxiliary geniuses. Now, this is, of course, ironical. He mentioned all these things because. <clears throat> They are actually, instead of, you know, bringing into some kind of order, what they're doing, they're regulating the society, the, the troglodytes, in, in, as they start afresh with human civilization. And gradually you understand if imitation becomes a way of living for the herd, you know, there will be, there will be a kind of acute dullness of a society. And, and we are actually going back to the caves. That is what Tade tells us in that uh, uh, underground man, where people are uh, actually quite happy. You know, happy to be amused, happy to be gratified, uh, happy to not think, happy to not imagine, uh, happy to not be self-reflexive. They just do things, right? And they are happy. That has been provided. Now, this this is something. This avidity about this this group of people, multiplicity of relationships by which society runs, I think is very important to un maybe quite an interesting way to understand what is what might be going on. Uh, with our culture right now, you know, with with with, with the world right now in some sense. That's a, so imitation. I would say is the first thing. Second point is what I can see is a very interesting kind of mix of the vernacular, the local and the and the global. What is of course people have used the word local. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. 
Yes, yes, yes. Right. You are. Well. So what you see is you know, what one can see is that there is a kind of art should have been decentralized in this you know world of free internet and you know free movement. Instead, what we are seeing there is a kind of vernacularization. Vernacularization, uh, not a very interesting kind of vernacularization, but a very identitarian form of vernacularization, which is narrower and narrower. You know. So there's a kind of you know a very interesting again oxymoron vernacular global one can say it is does not seem like dem- democratic in the way it was supposed to be right uh, this is the second point about this global vernacularization and each of us forming small sects you know small silos uh, where we feel comfortable even before the pandemic it had already started the pandemic of course has literalized has made things literal about going to the caves right now the third point i would say of course is about circulation the circulation comes with spin right we all know uh, uh, there is nothing benign about circulation there are you know uh, <clears throat> the internet beams for example boil into the hellish recesses of of the of the of the net and what one can say and positively and i already said in the beginning i want to at one and positively engage with the with the flotsams that we see around the 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 kind of cultural artifacts that we see now around say meme is an, a good example and people will say this meme magic this term you know but the magic i think has also a connection with with the other side or worse side of magic is something that professor matthews has already mentioned there is a kind of there is a kind of occultness there is a kind of ritualization of that magic you know so that you know information technology is is moving to a some kind of media media ritual at times and that media rituals could be quite uh, quite telling and quite horrifying and quite again quite narrow you know without expanding the the horizons of 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 what of this sup- supposedly magical category of memes right you know uh besides of course we know that information that travels is nothing is is actually a, 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 is not production that is benign but which which uh, which uh, which is actually dead labor dead labor meaning you know that there are certain people who work on these things but uh, of course you know the government somewhere up there centralization government or or big corporations who are who are ruling the uh, scene etc you know now you know very recently some of you may have heard about this term post cinema you know i heard it very recently from one of my uh, you know uh, friends who is into film studies and he said you know we were always interested in moving images but can we call what we see now as moving images on our you know cell phones cinema can we call it cinema or should we have another name you know for this moving image now there's a big debate apparently going on there you know that this idea of electronic mode of expression automatism of cinema what someone calls post continuity of films now uh, and, and there are a lot of issues there uh, uh, because there's they found out you know there are now long takes there are unsteady camera uh, there are frames and uh, and uh, which spill over to the outside and so on all these interesting things but all these interesting things also has a very a uh, financial side to it our circulation right in the a new dimension is is of that all visuality is rendered cinematic uh, in late capitalism uh, or you know whatever terms you, you use now late capitalism jameson used way back you can use another term but something more refined possibly now the three this three points to begin with you know imitation and then global and vernacular and then then circulation now i come to because today's talk is about literature i said you know about the literary suppose i take seriously this and i we ought to take seriously whatever is happening around us you know we we should not be patronizing and yet we have to understand what is going on you know what are the possibilities of 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 artistic possibilities in what we are seeing around what are the po- political possibilities you know etc uh, etc et et so suppose someone says to me you know ar- <coughs> puts an argument that well whatever you are seeing uh, saying is uh, all right uh, uh, but don't you see this you know means and images that we are seeing now there's a parod- parodic structure there you know don't you see that i already mentioned kick don't you see them there is a uh, there is a uh, there's a lot of irony there there is a, uh, you can call them pastiche if you like you can use those words now uh, now i can talk you know now now as a student of literature i can say okay if you say parody then let us talk seriously about parody right 
let us talk let us go back to the classical definition of parody and then see how parody has evolved that is what we are taught and that is what what we teach in literature departments that is what we are trained in you know we know we have to make a distinction between parody and say burlesque or you know or or uh, mock epic or you know pastiche all these are distinct terms you know these are they these cannot be conflated right so easily that's what we learn from our undergrad undergrad days so okay parody so Parody is supposed to be a stylistic signaling of irony, right? That is a very simple definition. That is to say, you have to. There has to be a, some. Someone has done something, and you are you are calling attention to the parodic artifact, attention to the exhaustion of that original uh, art product, right? So, so, but uh, so you do that. Par parody will have a kind of a reputation, and yet it will keep keep a distance from the original. So. Parody essentially, the first thing about parody is, you know, of course, irony, but also that it has a very interesting, you know, uh, relationship with the original. It has, it is not trying to diss the original. It is not trying to take down the original. You know, what Professor Matthews mentioned, cancel culture, is not trying to take down something. What it's trying to do is it's trying to make fun of something and yet having a very interesting relationship with the, uh, with the original, right? And uh, sometimes parody ha will be more uh conservative and be more uh, uh connected to the original sometimes it would be more eccentric eccentric right that will be parodies out of center eccentric and so that both the artist and the audiences get get the fun of of what, what parody is for example very famously shakespeare's sonnet number 130 my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun is a parody So it was getting into a ritual, a routine, and you know, and it was trying to uh, become all praise of the of of one's lover and so on. And Shakespeare was trying to parody that. But Shakespeare was not was quite very reverential of of Petrarch. He was he was not trying to diss Petrarch. He was trying to form a different relationship outside of Petrarch. Shakespeare may have inaugurated you know modernity, Western modernity, but but by by taking off from Petrarch, you know. That's that's something. Don Quixote, for example, Cervantes's you know uh, uh, archi archi novel, let us say, is of course a parody on medieval romances. And then in 20th century, you know, Borges again second time parodies Don Quixote in his Pierre Menard story, right? Uh, <clears throat> Austin Powers parodying James Bond, for example, or Monty Python and the Holy Grail parodying Arthurian legends, for example. All these there are many multiple examples from all walks of art you can bring those but but notice the relationship notice the oscillation between identity and non-identity between identity and difference there's always these two poles within which parody works it cannot go on one side or the other what is happening now i i'm afraid i suspect that's my hint is that we are losing touch with this precisely this element of of making making very interesting kind of wit we are look we're, we're missing that wit and this uh, to to say things at slight angle. Instead of doing that, we are becoming much more in your face, and therefore we are losing the 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 figures of speech without which what literature cannot be. You know. Now, I mean, if you say that okay, what is burlesque or what is caricature? Of course, they also have their own way of looking into things. You know, of course, it is ludicrous. Rape of the lock, Pope's rape of the lock, famously, as you know, it's a it's a burlesque, high burlesque. You know, but. But that again has a very interesting way of, of, of understanding uh, what literature is. You're playing with form and so on. Suppose you say, you know, uh, well, the, uh, can we not call this pastiche? We have also heard this term pastiche. Pastiche is, is, a, is reverential to the, uh, to the earlier form. Let us say uh, Tom Stoppard's play, Rosencrantz and Gilderstern are not dead. Is a, suppose it's a pastiche on Shakespeare's Hamlet, you know. You take part to the whole and reward the part. That is pastiche, you know. But it may pastiche sometimes may be blank, but it is still trying to seriously engage with the original. You know, that, that is where the fun is. You know. Instead of that, what we see sometimes today is this, uh, this what is the pattern of humor? I mean, really, we are trying to understand what exactly is humor now. Every morning when we wake up and look at our cell phone, or we see those, you know, whatever we see, if you want to see whole day, what is the pattern of humor? That is the... What what are the kind of say for example stand up comedies? I'm not an expert on stand up comedies, but you know you have to tell me, I, and and you know I'll, uh, I have to be educated myself. You know I'm speaking from a different era. I I I may be entirely wrong, but I'm trying to open myself up to the possibility of what does replicating and 
satiety, you know, the kind of satiation that we see with this unnuanced literal, literalization every day. Where is this comic event? Comedy is supposed to release us with love, some kind of release, even if it is very caustic, you know, it can be very caustic, right? I mean, go back to Aristophanes, it was very caustic, right? But yet, it is, it is not about contamination, it is about, it is not supposed, it, it is not supposed to give us an easy therapy, you know. Uh, easy therapy is another problem. That is what I think in a, in a way that we are looking for more. I mean, someone say that what you see in today's means culture is what one can call reasonably hostile. And a very interesting phrase again, reasonably hostile, very interesting oxymoron, I would say. Well, I, what, what is reasonably hostile? You want to bring down certain people and yet you're reasonable. Uh, what kind of bonding is happening there? You know, What kind of solidarities are we forming? There's political implication for that, right? I mean, is there anything transformative about it, about what we are seeing in, in the art products and so on? I would say, um, if I want to look at, you know, what is the nature of allusion? All this that I've said so far is about, literature is about allusion, right? In some way or the other. Uh, one way to look at literature. In, in, uh, instead of, you know, what, instead of the allusion that I was talking about, what we see now, I think, is uh, uh, two points, I would say. One, a very interesting self-consciousness, self-seriousness about everything that we do, right? And I'm not exempt from this. You know, I'm not keeping myself out of this, you know. Uh, so that if you're self-conscious, how can you have this traffic between identity and difference, as we used to have in parody, you know? Or how can you pay homage as in pastiche? Now, if you're self-conscious, what you will also not do, Professor Matthews was talking about dialogue. Dialogue is the very important, there's the other side. But suppose you are not interested in dialogue, you are interested in darkness, you are interested in nihilism, right? That is a fair, I'll take that into account. Suppose nihilism is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, uh, is an important political and literary way of looking into things. But I, I don't think if you're self-conscious, how can we be nihilistic? You know? Nihilists are not self-conscious people. They have a very interest, they, they, they move out of, they, they don't, they're not interested in, in relevance, you know. Uh, I mean, I mean, you think about serious nihilists like Dostoevsky, let us say, you know, or, or others in art, right? Uh, the one is self-consciousness. The second point, I think something very new is happening right now. This I have to give, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, all of us are seeing a lot of anger, right? Anger everywhere. You know, in Delhi, I'm here, I see this, you know, angry Hanuman everywhere um, uh, on, on the car. And you know, I mean, so anger everywhere. Now, anger is a legitimate emotion, you know. You know, I think as students of literature, we have to, you have to, you have to account for anger, you know. Now, the point is not about anger. The point is how you are deploying anger in literature and art, how you're playing with anger. Is an element, I mean, I, I'm using the word play, not in the sense of being jocular, but you know, how, how you navigate anger, you know. I see in this anger, there's a kind of defensiveness, you know. This anger is a kind of defensive anger that we see in this meme memes that we see, I mean, I'm not generalizing memes as, but the, the, what we see in the artifacts often, if you're defensive with your anger, if you're not going the whole log, or if you're not playing with anger, you're not transformative, you're not interested in transformation, right? So what is happening on one hand, you're self-serious, on the other hand, you're angry, right? And uh, if these two things, you are, you are neither being nihilistic, it could be really dark in your approach to art, and uh, and have a very very interesting romantic trait. Nor can you be transformative in in the way if you are not generalizing your anger. So in, in that sense, I think I come to my, uh, how much time do I have, Mithilesh? Uh, another uh, ten minutes. Okay. So now I mean I've spent enough time with my preamble. I'll talk a bit more a bit about imagination now, which was supposed to be my subject. The other side of populism. Let us say I'm trying to argue that you know. It is, today's times are deeply anti-intellectual. I think everyone will agree on that, you know. But I say it's also deep, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, not so, not an investment in imagination. I mean, without, uh, without inventiveness, I'm using this term uh, by Derek Attridge, inventiveness, you know, without inventiveness, how can you have art and literature, right? That part is missing, I think, you know, because, if art becomes immediate gratification or art becomes, you know, um, uh, giving opinions and similar kind of imitative opinions, right, you know, 
someone dies or someone writes a book you go to facebook you see you know intelligent people knowledgeable people like copy pasting the same line you know i'm so sorry someone is dead rip rip you know how is that happening you know i mean i'm going back to gabriel tarde therefore this imitative society how can in intelligent people not have anything interesting to say right so you or you're trying to gain popularity at any cost or there's some pecuniary you know remittance or something go i don't know uh, you want viewer augmentation maybe you know uh, i mean it's good why shouldn't we want viewer augmentation you know i mean when we are criticizing populism or taking into account I mean, we also have to take account populism so the phenomena itself you know we have to understand the phenomena first before we take a jab you know now the, i mean <clears throat> so it's distractive right distraction no distraction is very important for literature uh, something that I have really not worked out, and I ask you to also think about it. I think there is some good distraction, there is some bad distraction. I mean, some productive distraction, some not so. I mean, if you're distracted the whole day in this manner, we are not uh, you are not engaging with anything. It's not. But distraction, on the other hand, is central to imagination, isn't it? You, uh, you remember Samuel Taylor Coleridge's uh, ideas, or you know, remember without reverie, you cannot have romantic poetry, right? Without fragments, you cannot have romantic or modern poetry. You know? Without distraction, how can you have that? Now, that's a different kind of distraction we're talking about. That's a distraction of solitude. That is not a distraction of the herd. You are talking about, if you are thinking about romanticism, since I'm talking about romanticism, literature and humanities, always, we are always asked to justify, you know, what are we doing, you know? So that is not the way one should look at. Often you will see newspapers are writing, you know, no, no, literature is very important for uh, they make us more humane, you know, they make us more complex, etc., etc. Uh, I mean, these are very defensive way of justifying. You don't need to justify your, I mean, def literature has, a, if you go back to the lyric, it's about babbling, right? I mean, when someone falls in love, someone babbles. When someone is in acute pain and someone loses his voice, right? So, I mean, and, and lyric poetry starts there from Sappho onwards, you know. Uh, tragedy, comedy, romantic forms, you know, modernist ways, flaneur, I mean, name it. I mean, across across centuries, you know, there you have to understand the play of play of literature, right? It is not about sensationalism only. It cannot be about sensationalism. It has to be something else, something more, something what one calls, uh, romantics will call it striving. We strive for something, right? Striving, approximation of the absolute. How does one ap approximate? How does one long for the infinite, say God or, or your love and so on, you know. There are ways, literature has, art and literature has given us ways already. We can rework those in our way, way, say through wit, irony, allegory, myth formation, creative imagination, what have you, right? You can do all those, right? <clears throat> so, uh, so those are the ways. So imagination, I think, is the glue about art and literature. Imagination in the largest sense, what one calls poiesis. Poiesis is, you are, when you imagine, you are trying to bring into literature something which is an excess, something which is uncanny, right? Something, a miraculous thing. Miraculous thing you are bringing through the image. And then you can create new images. You artists create new images. And as a receptor, suppose you're reading a book or you're watching an art object, you are also bringing miracle to that, to that art object by your gaze, by your, each one of us bring that. When we read a novel, we are transformed after re reading great novels, right? Uh, by great, I do not mean canonical novels only. You know. I mean all kinds of stuff, literature. So, so something changes in me. What is that change? You know. So it's a transcending force it's in the excess. Imagination has an eye. Imagination has an ear. Imagination has skin, right? So it triggers something. It triggers something which is forbidden, an irrepressible need. It's, it's, it, it, that's, a, that's the genuine urge for change, right? Change for the poetic. Change is poetic, right? But replication is not poetic. Replication means you are trying to conserve something. You are not interested in change. You are trying to conserve the existing thing and not going anywhere. And, and most importantly, you are not trying to invent language. You are not interested in stories. Without stories, what literature, right? That is the basic, the fictive, right? Stories of all kinds of people, stories of people who are soft, who are vulnerable, who are humiliated, who are forgotten, who are lost, who are powerful stories of millions of stories, you know. Can you think about literature without the Arabian Nights, without Shahrazad telling stories? Right? I mean, 
why 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 are we awake all night not because some some issues are given issues come issues are there i'm awake because you know something is making me the story is making me awake i can't sleep right when i read cortazar or uh, i don't know uh, uh, rusty or whoever you know great authors so there is a fragility of solitude without fragility of solitude there is no love there is no beauty right no politics most importantly i would say of serious politics now if you are not romantic you, you do not have to be all of us are not romantics absolutely right why should we be romantics only but we we may be something else about literature we may we, we may bring virtue to literature the obverse of romanticism is is to bring think about a criteria to judge literature even there you know if you if you are if you are into if you want to judge literature in a, in a serious fashion you have to look at imagination you have to look at art as something which has a future possibility that is the responsibility of art it is uh, the futurity of art you know that, that, that's the honesty of the artist one would say not not mere scurrility you know scurrility is not going to give you that um, you know that connection between time time what the time that we are passing through let us say and transcending the time through literature an artist is aware of the time but also transcends time article is particular and also universal simultaneously okay so so we have to move from that but we also we have to we have to understand that populism but we also i think art is also has to challenge academicism the other side is abstruseness like right, from the academics who are um, uh, who has detached themselves from from life detached themselves from uh, 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 from from art and life, and that is one of the challenges I think that populism is making in art, in literature, also in politics and history. That you know, people are cut off, intellectuals are cut off, other people are cut off, and therefore they are challenging the mass the mass challenge that we are seeing, both from the right and the left, the polarization that we are seeing now, uh, from from uh, every side, right? So there's no no middle. I mean, <clears throat> we are talking about dialogue, right? There is also a dissociation of sensibility now. I see. You know, T. S. Eliot called dissociation of sensibility. You know, we see now, you know, feeling, trauma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in 20th century, later there was objectivity and so on. You know, now you know this subjective-objective division between thought and intellect. This is a very populist way of looking into things. You know, how can you distinguish thought and in, uh, and feeling so easily, right? You cannot. So, but all these things. You know, I'm 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 rambling a little bit, but I think I'll make my point. You know, iterate my point about about taking a leap. Really, literature is about taking, art is about taking some kind of leap, right? Some some immeasurable thing, an an abyss. You know, if you are if you are if you are, if you take that risk, then you gain something. Uh, 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 there's a kind. Of, it's a, it's a it's a meditative act, right? You know, meditative. I'm using the word in a in a in a very serious sense. Um, um, uh, art and religion, for example, is a very powerful way of getting into that that cusp. Uh, think about Gerard Manley Hopkins or John Donne or you know or or people in in our country who have who are great artists at the same time, uh, greatly devotional people and so on. You know, but all of these people have, have immersed themselves. There's an immersion. That immersion is 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 missing, and therefore I I suspect uh, there is what what we started with no brow the no brow thing the the flying over thing that we are what that we see today. That's what is happening. You know that. We are no. We are. We have to free ourselves. Free ourselves. Free our imagination. Uh, we are uh, instead of that. We are moving into silos. And what kind of silos? Silos of the, of of, of relevance. Silos of, of 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 making an comment or opinion to everything and anything that we see. If we speak more, of course we will be garrulous, right? Anyone will be garrulous, right? We we'll lose that solitude, or lose that 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 nuance to do and write literature and, and and be artistic that is my guess you know i'll stop here you know i'll stop here because uh, what i'm really trying to say is is is, is the radical openness of literature uh, which comes from imagination i would say among other things and, and they play with the form thank you uh, thank you uh, very much uh, professor prashant chakravarti